Thank you for coming, everyone. My name is Father Joe Farrell. I work in our Office for Mission and Ministry, and I'd like you to be most welcome to this event. A um, couple of things as we begin. One is, first, Happy Augustinian Heritage Month. The, woo! the month of November, we're dedicating to uh, both our celebration and our understanding of our traditions and our heritage as uh, Augustinian University. And so as part of that celebration, we have uh, a retreat planned, we have uh, lectures, we've placed uh, banners on Ryan's Way. Please, as you're going down Ryan's Way uh, behind Sullivan Hall, uh, look up. Notice the banners. Uh, it's our way of, of trying to bring an awareness of Villanova's Augustinian tradition and Augustinian heritage. That's the first announcement. Second one is that you are all most welcome to be here, and we thank you for being here. Uh, Father George Lawless is with us, and I'm going to invite you to, as he's delivering his, uh, his lecture, to please think of questions that you'd like to pose. Um, it could be a question based on uh, something that he says, something from your own experience, um, but I'm going to ask you to please think of some questions as the lecture is going forward. And then I'm going to ask you to stay for the question and answer period. It's an important part of this entire process. Um, some of you have told me you absolutely need to leave at a certain time. Uh, please know that if you do, these seats make a lot of noise. <laughs> and so please be conscious of that. They are, they are not the quietest seats. That was nice timing. They are not the quietest seats. Um, so I'm going to ask you to please be, uh, to be, be aware of that. Um, we, uh, we are very happy to have Father George Lawless with us. Um, he is no stranger to Villanova University. Uh, George Lawless is an Augustinian friar and priest and an alumnus of Villanova. The class of 1952 uh, with a major in philosophy. He earned his master's degree in theology, an MA in theology at Augustinian College in Washington DC, an MA from Catholic University in Greek and Latin, an MA in Classics at the University of Pennsylvania, a Theology Master's in Ecumenics and Ethics, Princeton Theological Seminary, sabbatical leave at Durham University in England, and a Doctorate in Theology at St. Thomas Aquinas University, the Angelicum in Rome. <laughs> Father, <laughs> yes. Father Lawless has been living in Rome for the last 40 years, since 1979, lecturing on St. Augustine in the Italian language. He's an adjunct professor at the Gregorian University, professor of historical theology at the Patristic Institute, the Augustinianum, a visiting professor in patristics at the Angelicum, an associate professor of religious studies, where he was also chairman of the Department of Religion at our sister school at Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts a scholar in residence in the School of Theology at Seton Hall, a visiting lecturer in ancient church history at the Princeton Theological Seminary. Father Lawless's articles have been widely published in English. Several have been translated into Italian, French, Spanish, and Polish. His articles are found in many different uh, reviews. The Downside Review, Studia Patristica, Augustinianum, just to name a few. The Augustinian Studies, Religious Life Review. He has a book, Augustine of Hippo and His Monastic Rule, by Clarendon Press in Oxford. It was published in paperback in 1990. It's now available online, beginning in 2011, in the Oxford Scholarship Online. I had the pleasure of living with Father Lawless when I studied in Rome and lived in Rome. We had some great experiences there, so it really is a pleasure to welcome you to Driscoll Hall, welcome you to this event during Augustinian Heritage Month after so long an absence. Father Lawless will speak to us on a great topic, Augustine growing up. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation to return to Villanova and especially to lecture on my favorite father of the church, 
My Villanova professor, Robert Russell, said he has, how did he put it? He has buried all his undertakers. <laughs> and that's why you are here this evening. I dedicate this lecture to the memory of 98 Augustinian martyrs, priests, and young students like yourselves who were shot by the firing squad or brutally tortured to death during the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 39. And their feast day we commemorate today. This is a wonderful well way to commemorate these 98 martyrs. 16 centuries ago, during the Easter Vigil, the 24th and 25th of May, at 33 years of age, an old Roman from the province of Numidia in North Africa was baptized by Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, in the north of Italy. That decision to seek baptism, together with his son, Ad Deodatus, and his friend, lifelong friend, Alypius, was to have incalculable consequences for the Christian churches and for all of Western civilization. That convert to Catholic Christianity was Aridius Augustine. He was born on the 13th of November, 354, at Tagast, now Suk Aras, in modern Algeria, very much in the news these days with Libya. Situated some 60 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea, and one of three routes, overland routes, connecting the seacoast cities of Hippo, modern Anaba, and Carthage. The backwater town of Tagast, his birthplace, featured little more than a hotel for visitors, travelers notably, with only an elementary school available to him in his hometown Augustine, a serious but by no means exceptional student, attended high school at Madaura, some 20 miles distant from his birthplace to Gast. As a teenager, he associated with a group of hooligans who were called wreckers. While he deplored their destruction of property, still he enjoyed their company in much the same way that he reveled in the company of other adolescent friends when together they heedlessly stole pears from an orchard, an incident made famous in his Confessions, Book Two, some 2,000 words, the gang age, teenagers' behavior. Augusta was no different from other boys at school and he had an intense dislike for the study of Greek. However, the fact that he went to high school at all set him apart from many of his peers at Tagast. When he completed high school at 15 years of age, Augustine returned home. As he was preparing to leave for advanced studies in philosophy and rhetoric at the end of the year, his father died. Patrick, Augustine's father, was a man who lived all his life as a pagan and was converted to Christianity only shortly before his death. This significant loss happened at the very time that Augustine was experiencing a year of youthful idleness while his parents were scraping together enough money to advise still further their son's education. Now widowed and with three children, Monica, the mother of Augustine, 
was singularly fortunate to have the help of a wealthy landowner and resident of Tagast who was willing to provide the necessary financial support for his education at Carthage, a city some 170 miles away. Ancient Carthage was notorious as a sizzling frying pan for illicit loves, so much so that the Latin wordplay Carthago, Carthage, and Sartago, a cauldron, in T.S. Eliot's poetic version of this youthful adventure, reads, to Carthage I came burning, 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 burning. Paganism had indeed been a powerful force at Medaura, where Augustine spent his high school years, and again at Carthage, where he continued his formal education. Having become the father of a son born out of wedlock at 17 years of age, Augustine now settled into cohabitation with the mother of their son, Adeo Datus, a name which means gift of God, Adeo Datus. When he was 18 years of age, Augustine read the Hortensius of Cicero, which he afterwards described as a book that altered his outlook on life. Near the end of the book that altered his outlook on life, he decided to pursue philosophy and rhetoric at Carthage. And at the same time, he joined an oriental religious sect to which he gave his allegiance for the next nine years of his life. When Augustine returned to his birthplace, after completion of advanced studies, philosophy and rhetoric, his mother barred him from the house, wouldn't let him in. Monica made more strenuous objection to her son's adherence to Manichaeism than to his cohabitation with a young woman. With his proselytizing temperament, Augustine already had made converts to the Manichaean religion and told even his staunchly pious mother that someday, mother, you too will become a Manichae like myself. Tigast, however, proved to be not accommodating to Augustine's ambition. And after having opened a school, Augustine found the effort, the ambience of Tigast, not at all equal to his ambitions. Even more distressing to him was the unexpected death of an intimate young friend, and Augustine was disconsolate. Both of these circumstances prompted him to leave his hometown hurriedly. He returned to Carthage. There, at little more than 20 years of age, he read the categories of Aristotle, a book on logic which helped to shape the orderliness of his mind. He must have read it in Latin, a Latin translation, because he despised Greek and he didn't have the knowledge of Greek to read such a work as the categories of Aristotle. And he says, however, that he read the book without the aid of a tutor. There followed a gradual disenchantment with the Manichaean religion, but its ardent devotees prevailed upon their co-religionist to persevere. Their most distinguished teacher, Faustus, they promised, would eventually visit Carthage and respond to Augustine's many questions. Faustus finally came 
but his torrent of words was all fantasy and fable. Augustine's disillusionment increased. To make matters worse, the students at Carthage proved to be reckless and disorderly, with the result that Augustine's level of job satisfaction as a teacher was pitifully low. Putting all these considerations together, Augustine determined to seek new horizons. It was only the cruel trick of deliberately lying to his mother and leaving her praying for him patiently in a local chapel at the dock that enabled Augustine to sail for Rome from Carthage with his partner and their son. Monica went home alone. The confessions tell us, I went to Rome. Dissatisfied with the failure of Faustus to make a strong case for Manichaeism, Augustine shortly thereafter despaired of finding truth. He became a skeptic. Although he had intellectually dissociated himself from the Manichaeans in Rome, he befriended them initially at least, and even lived in the house of one of their distinguished members. Augustine started teaching and soon discovered that Roman students, as even today, refuse to pay their tuition and their fees. <laughs> Eventually, through the influence of Symmachus, the prefect of Rome, Augustine's own merits as a teacher, and the important fact that he was not a Catholic Christian these secured for himself the prestigious post of public orator at Milan. This ambitious young man from a middle-class provincial family in far-off Africa, North Africa, had now become an upper-class urban professional, a yuppie, a young urban upper-class professional who would surely catch the eye of the imperial court in Milan. Milan was a highly cosmopolitan city. Its sophisticated residents made fun of Augustine with his rustic North African accent. Not long after his arrival, Augustine visited the urbane and learned bishop of Milan Ambrose. But the encounter had the nature of a courtesy call. More importantly, the meeting prompted Augustine to attend Sunday worship for the sake of savoring the eloquence of this famous preacher. It was not long before this young man, who had been attracted by Ambrose's delivery of the gospel, he showed interest in the gospel of delivery. He became less critical of the Bible with its confusing contents and its inelegant Latin style. Gradually, he became open to receive its message. At the same time, through his interest in philosophy, he attached himself to an established circle of people, the Milanese circle, so-called, who are conversant with the Christian religion and Greek philosophers, notably Plato, Plotinus, and Porphyry. The story of the conversion to Christianity of Marius Victorinus had a profound effect upon Augustine because he was, like himself, a notable and respected rhetorician. Indeed, his first-hand acquaintance with the many people of keen mind for whom faith and reason were certainly compatible, Augustine convinced, was convinced that Catholic Christianity, after all, was intellectually respectable. In the meantime, some other writings of the Platonist put him in touch 
with what was deepest in himself, his own ability to conceive of a world within, that crucial link with the interior realm of the spiritual and the immaterial. Monica, meanwhile, had joined her son. She really was a pushy mother. Imagine, she probably traveled by herself from Algeria to Milan. Incredible. We'll see more of that pushiness, if you will. Her intrusive manner, I call it, she wasted no time arranging a suitable marriage for her son. As a result, Augustine's unnamed mother of Adeodatus was summarily dismissed. She returned to North Africa, vowing never again to have sexual relations with another man. Augustine withheld her name from posterity, undoubtedly out of personal respect for her, but also for the obvious reason that his confessions were widely circulated during his lifetime as Bishop of Hippo. From the beginning, both parties were aware that their liaison was conceivably destined to become ephemeral. This is why mistress is conceivably an ill-suited word for depicting Augustine's lover, his companion for more than a decade, and the mother of their son. There is no doubt in my mind and this is lawless speaking loudly, that in the long run, many years of living with this woman gave rise to some of Augustine's mature and enlightened reflections on love, friendship, trust, human affectivity, and fidelity in marriage. Augustine then became formally engaged to a young girl who was two years below the legal age for marriage. Now, according to the Codex of Justinian, girls could marry at age 12. The institutes tell us that. That means that the girl was age 10 and mother arranged the marriage. While he agreed to the terms of this legally, socially acceptable union, the Codex of Justinian says that the boy has to be a minimum of age 14. Augustine took up with another woman, older, merely to satisfy his sexual needs. In a sensate culture which greatly resembled our own. Augustine described himself as a man who was, in his own words, hot for honors, money, and marriage. Be that as it may, we ought not to overstress or exaggerate the sinfulness of Augustine's youth and his middle years. Augustine's behavior contrasted sharply with the marital infidelities of Patrick, his father. Also, he deeply loved both the woman and the boy. He dedicated a book to him, a book on education, and his son was intelligent enough to become the interlocutor. He also, I say, deeply loved the son. Her callous dismissal can be explained partially, possibly, by the fact that the late Roman caste system prohibited people of different social status from marrying. It is fair to suggest that prospects of marriage 
had never occurred to either of them. There is, in fact, evidence to indicate that the Catholic Church countenanced such an informal liaison. I quote the Council of Toledo in the year 400, Canon 17. And also Augustine himself in a book that he wrote called The Excellence of Marriage. And it is chapter five, paragraph five. Notwithstanding, neither Monica nor Augustine give a good account of themselves in the peremptory dismissal of Augustine's partner. I'll return to this, but we are describing the resolution of a painful personal entanglement from our viewpoint of a later time and culture, and we are not entitled, therefore, to read history backwards. To assess Augustine's behavior at any period of his life is by no means an easy task. Long ago, at age 18, Cicero's Hortensius had alerted the young Augustine not only to the value of wisdom as a worthy goal in life, but also to the responsible use of money and wealth. From that time of young manhood, he undertook constant struggle to support the small family of the mother of Adeodatus and their son, for his salary as a teacher was scarcely adequate to meet their needs. When he was 32 years of age, the struggle was no less severe, since the family had grown to include his mother, and shortly thereafter two teenage cousins, and his brother, Navigius. It was a period of strain, both financially and professionally. While Augustine had friends in high places, and they were good to him, the hard fact remained, he needed money and a wife who had some. In my book, I didn't sound so harsh, and Henry Chadwick wrote me from Oxford, tell the plebs, George, he needed money and a wife who had some. I have great respect for Chadwick's scholarship of Augustine. What then did Augustine do next? He did what could not be predicted and what could not be explained. He resigned his teaching position and he did it as sharply as Monica had dismissed the mother of a Deodatus and sent her packing back to North Africa. Except for some private tutoring, Augustine was out of work, having resigned his teaching position near the end of the school term. What can we say about such uncharacteristic behavior? Not much, with certainty, except to remark that Augustine appeared to be on the verge of a total rearrangement of his life. Augustine also manifested the symptoms of what we today would describe as a nervous breakdown, beyond the fact that he suffered pains from a chest ailment, probably pleurisy, and also hemorrhoids. His own words make it clear that ambition and honor propelled him on that restless journey from his native Tagast to Madaura, from Madaura to Carthage, from Carthage to Rome, from Rome to Milan, where finally success was conceivably very close at hand. Even the governorship of a Roman province. The facts of his life make it clear also that the allurement of wealth and money was the first to lose its luster for Augustine. Prospects of a political appointment 
and the prestige of holding public office were the next allurements to loosen their very tenacious grip upon Augustine's vaulting ambition. He later remarked that as a boy, he had been a poor loser at games. The dialogues of Cicero had long ago advised him that virtue was sufficient for happiness, certainly not wealth, nor honor, nor sex. Sex was the last stronghold to imprison Augustine as his erotic needs held out virtually to the final stage of his conversion. The raging desires inside him were surely reflected in his fervent prayer. Grant me chastity and self-control, but please, not yet. That's a brilliant translation of the original Latin. No one can improve upon it. It's a nun, a, 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 an Angli not a Roman Catholic nun, but she has written really and given us the best translation in English of the Confessions. Augustine was determined to marry. In this matter, Monica was even more determined than he. In her mind, marriage was the only possible way for her son to live the Christian ideal. In his own mind, Augustine remained unsettled about the question of marriage. Although marriage might lead him to wealth and power, it did not promise to satisfy his desire for wisdom. Perhaps instead, it might even lead him astray. On this very question, Augustine engaged frequently in earnest discussion with Olypius, his lifelong friend. For those who are serious in the pursuit of wisdom, Olypius argued clearly and definitely in favor of the need for celibacy. Augustine was not so sure. At any rate, Augustine's journey towards wisdom, begun with the reading of Cicero, had met with disappointment in the Bible, had been sidetracked with the Manichees, and seemed to be far from having reached its end in the dry abstractions of philosophy. This ever-burning desire for wisdom was not apparently sufficient explanation for the dramatic turn of events in his life. I want to tell two short stories of conversion. Two things happened that might and that definitely nudged Augustine closer to the moment of conversion. The first was a simple story that provoked his thoughts. The second was an experience so mysterious and so profound that Augustine himself found it difficult to describe in his confessions some 10 years later. Perhaps it was simply difficult to describe, but perhaps also simply by the fickle stroke of mere coincidence that two events happened together at this time. Perhaps it was instead not a fickle stroke, but the steady hand of God in his providence. The simple story of conversion came to Augustine's attention during the visit of another North African named Pontician, who happened to notice that Augustine owned a copy of the epistles of St. Paul. This prompted Pontician to relate the story of two public officials who had found themselves in a dilemma very much like that of Augustine. Young and ambitious and engaged to be married, these two young men were in steady pursuit of those pleasures that the world offered to them. Yet these two government employees were so deeply affected by the invitation of St. Matthew's Gospel, 1921, to sell all and give to the poor. 
that they abandoned their possessions, these two young military recruits. So enthusiastic was their conversion that they inspired their fiancés to follow their example and to enter a monastery for women. The breeze of asceticism to anyone who knows ancient history was in the air of the early 5th century, not only North Africa, but what is now Southern Europe. The impact of this story forced Augustine to reflect upon his own life, as he tells us in the Confessions. Pontician told us this story, and as he spoke, you, O Lord, turned me back upon myself. You took me from behind my own back, where I had placed myself, because I did not wish to look upon myself. All of this was new and startling to Augustine and his best friend, Olypius. More than a century later, Antony of Egypt had left the city for the desert in response to the same gospel verse, Matthew 19, 21. The story of Antony's conversion to solitude, prayer, and poverty was famous. But strangely, Augustine and Olympias knew nothing about it until that moment. News of this strange yet compelling way of life filled Augustine with a surge of feelings that he was not able to put into words. My anguish of mind, he tells us, tore me from Olympias. While astounded, he looked at me and yet kept silent. I did not speak in my usual way. My brow, cheeks, eyes, color, tone of voice, spoke of my state of mind more than the words I uttered. The second episode. is more difficult for us to grasp. Here, readers of the Confessions may wish that its author, in Book 8, had been less artistic in the telling. Some scholars actually dismiss, dismiss the event as though it were a literary fiction. Augustine heard the voice as if, his own words, as if, he says, of a boy or a girl chanting a repetitious refrain, pick it up and read, pick it up and read. Obediently, he hurried to the spot in the garden where Olypius was sitting. There he snatched the epistles of St. Paul, opened the volume, and read the first text that met his eye. It was Romans 13, 13, 14. No reveling or drunkenness, no debauchery or vice, no quarrels or jealousies. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make provision for no provision for the desires of the flesh. This is a powerful message for any reader of the Bible. It gets to the heart of Christian life. Why did it come to Augustine at this time? How did it affect him? What thoughts did he were provoked in his mind? We have no need to search for answers to these questions. Augustine shares this great moment of conversion with us in his own words. I had no wish to read further and no need. For in that instant, with the very ending of the sentence, it was as though a light of utter confidence shone in all my heart and the darkness of uncertainty vanished. For you had converted me to yourself so that I would seek neither wife nor ambition in this world. 
Augustine had been signed with the sign of exorcism, the sign of the cross, shortly after birth. And he drank in the name of Christ with his mother's milk. Nominally, at least, he had always remained a Catholic catechumen, except for his 13 years as a manichae. With unerring consistency, from age 18 to 32, he faulted the Hortensius of Cicero, the teachings of the Manichees, and the books of the Platonist for their failure to mention the name of Christ. Although he was an ardent Manichae in all matters except to reject their recommendation of personal chastity, Augustine never joined the elite members of the inner circle of this religious sect, which he later regarded as, quote, a childish superstition. Every doubt contain, contains some certitude, a foreshadowing of Descartes. By this time, Neoplatonic philosophy had laid the axe forever to the roots of Augustine's materialism by instructing him that God exists beyond matter and that God alone endows the human soul with some remarkable powers. He also came to realize that the Manichees made a mockery of human freedom by insisting that all human activity was the net result of mechanical forces warring against each other. His persistent fascination with astrology finally succumbed to the conviction that the fault lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. His distaste for the Bible was diminishing thanks to the preaching of Ambrose, which presented new and challenging insights into the meaning of God's words. The conflicting genealogies of Jesus, as they were recorded in the Gospels and so often ridiculed by the Manichees, no longer confused him. By urging him to read the prophet Isaiah, Ambrose had unlocked the riches of the Old Testament, and Augustine, for the first time, could grasp the legitimacy of referring to God as mother. Also, nurse. Also, a mother bird with her fledglings. For Augustine, to apply human qualities to God, whether masculine or feminine, had been in an earlier day rank heresy. Augustine will tell us it is better to be a cripple limping along to God than to be a champion athlete on the wrong track. For Augustine, at this stage of his life, he had traveled far enough along the road of his restless journey to discover that materialism, skepticism, Rationalism and a self-centered psychologism were indeed all the wrong track. By applying the stern test of logic to his understanding of God, gradually Augustine was able to accept some important fundamental religious truths. First, he came to learn that God is not embedded in matter even though Genesis 1.26 assures us that human beings are made in God's image and likeness. More importantly, he knew that evil is unworthy of God and God is not its source. God alone is the source of all goodness. Consequently, only God, who made human beings, makes human beings happy. It had been no easy path for Augustine to travel from doubt to certitude, from ignorance about God to his burning desire to possess God. But all along the way, he found that every doubt 
contains some certitude. The one who doubts is at least certain of being alive, and he is certain of doubting. Without mystery, reason and intelligence offer no exit. The mystery of faith in God and the actuality of human freedom offers exits everywhere. Psychology that bends us back solely upon ourselves soon becomes mired in the pool of Narcissus. Religious faith that turns us towards God gives us the freedom of full life in Christ. This is how Augustine grew, gradually in his understanding of God and the mystery of human iniquity. I created a human being, not avarice. I created a human being, not highway robbery. I created a human being, not marital infidelity. When he searched within himself to assess the condition of his own soul, Augustine exclaimed, I have become an enigma to myself. Some translate that as I have become a big question mark to myself. The sense of emptiness led him as he was turning within himself and being solely intent upon himself, there was nothing but doubt and confusion. This sense of emptiness inside led Augustine to cry out for God and for himself. But where was I when I looked to you? I could not find myself, much less you. Acceptance of mystery in human existence gave Augustine his first solid steps towards understanding God. The more he examined the puzzle and the more he searched the riddle that was himself, the more he felt a presence of the God who was within him. Yet all the time, you were more inward than my inmost self. All the while, I was outside, and you were inside. <clears throat> to conclude, Augustine never thought of himself as a saint. That we should regard him as a saint would indeed surprise him. When surrendered to God, his love for eloquence loosened his tongue in praise of God. When surrendered to God, he earned greater eloquence in the understanding of profundities. When surrendered to God, his unquiet heart and restless heart became quiet and found rest in the silent and mysterious presence of God that was always deep inside him. Thank you very much for your attention. Father Lawless, thank you. We do have a few moments, uh, probably about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, for those of you who, who have a question, raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone. I'm going to ask you to, to ask your question in the mic, and we'll take it from there. And they attributed it to you, someone who loves Augustine even more than his mother Monica loved him. Why is that true? And what is it about Augustine that keeps attracting you? Who is Bob Monahan? Monica. Monica. Your mother, 
Oh. Bob Monahan. Oh. <laughs> I don't know Bob Monahan. <laughs> you might have to like this. It would probably be best to be there just to get, uh, get recorded there. Is it Joseph Carolla who said that to you? Yes. Yeah. It was a Jesuit who said that <laughs> of me that I love. And he said it publicly. And I was not embarrassed. I was proud of it. Uh, I love Augustine because, as I said at the beginning, he has buried all his undertakers, people again and again and again. He didn't always get everything right, mind you. Uh, and, uh, but to doubt does lead to certainty, and he had lots of doubts. I think I'm being fair to Monica. That's a pretty cruel thing she did uh, to break up that liaison between the unnamed, I would not call her a mistress, nor would I call her a concubine, someone who simply lived or shacked up with him. They, they deeply loved one another. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And Maureen Tilly, I thought of her early when I was speaking about prayer and, and, and the ascetic of life, and also friendship. She is an authority on both. Don't ask us about our personal lives, but you know the saints on prayer and also on friendship. Uh, uh, I think there, there was genuine love there. It was, as I say, heartbreaking, uh, wrenching uh, separation. Uh, and uh, some people think that uh, Patricius doesn't get his due from me either, and that I just lay too much of a burden on, on Monica. But we don't know. It's history. It, it was a very painful entanglement, and separation was even more. But when he was broke and out of money and not able to support her, you know, and the child, and then the two cousins, uh, life is difficult, uh, but I'm just uh, admired. Look at the mobility in his life from Algeria to Milan. And he was away from North Africa only five years of his 76 years uh, uh, in, in another country. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I, I stand by what I say. And so is the Sister Marie Bolding. Uh, I've often, I've have thought this way, um, and uh, I'm getting more and more convinced. Uh, uh, his final words on marriage were at age 72 in the retractations, and he's commenting on his book, The Excellence of Marriage, The Excellence of Marriage, and he says, bonum et usus libidinis non est libido. The Bonus, the good and correct use of libido is not libido. Huh? Becoming obese, it could be an illness, but it could be libido. I just love to eat and eat and eat. Huh? Uh, and I'm so habituated to this style, uh, you know, of concupiscence, which is driving me. But there is a healthy concupiscence. It's good, but concupiscence is not always bad. And, and uh, sexual intercourse promotes the, the, the propagation of the race. But it's a question of, of ne quid nemis, nothing too extreme. Uh, so I don't know that I'm answering the question, but yeah. he has so much to offer in yeah. so many categories. Any other questions? Yes. Give you the microphone. Father, I went to a lecture that uh, stated that and tried to prove that Augustine was of the Negro race, because partly because he was from North Africa, partly because of his visage and his physical makeup, skeleton bones, I suppose. And do you uphold that in your research, that theory, that he was a black man? 
the, the question is regarding Augustine's race. Do you believe in your own research that, uh, what, what do you believe was Augustine's race? Was he a, a, more like a, a Negro in color? No, or? He, was, he was Caucasian. He was Caucasian. And he was an African. Uh, he was not Negroid. We, we know that much. He spoke Punic. That was his mother tongue, but he preferred it. The dominance of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th century was so powerful. Uh, was there a second element to it? <coughs> and if he were Negroid, so what? Really, and I think he'd be the first to say that. Yes? Father. Um, uh, after this whole talk, thank you for coming, by the way. I think I speak for everyone when I say we all appreciate it very much. Um, my question is, it's clear that St. Augustine is remiss um, for the sins he committed in his earlier life, you know, as a, what you just described. However, to what point do you feel that he recognizes the necessity of those sins in ultimately guiding him towards Christianity and the Catholic Church? The question is that Augustine recognizes his own sinfulness earlier in his, in his life, and he's sorry for that. Does he recognize a certain necessity in that sinfulness that led him to his eventual conversion and entrance into the church? An essential sinfulness. You mean that we are conditioned in such a way that it's inescapable? Uh, I think yes, in the phrase homo simul justus et peccatus, man is both sinner and just. Uh, there's a tension in our lives. The good that I wish I, I do not do and the evil that I do not wish, I go ahead and do it. Uh, I'm sort of out of control, a divided will and the tension between this vast field of goodness and this vast field of evil. And one has to discern. And the fault lies not in our stars, although he did give astrology much more breathing space than dealing with demons. But he was very, this would be part of his African culture, demonology and, and astrology. And he writes about it. Uh, rather extensively, especially uh, uh, not demonology, but the 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 the, the uh, magic and so on. I don't know that I'm answering your question. He seemed to be interested in everything. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Once the last question. Okay, one right up here. Um, hi. Um, in your lecture, you, you said, without mystery, reason and intelligence offer no exit. So I wasn't sure what you meant. I was thinking more of like on true religion when Augustine talked about free will and reason. Um, but I, didn't know, I don't know what you mean by reason and intelligence offer no exit when it, with respect to mystery. The question is, with regard to mystery, you said, without mystery, reason and intelligence offer no exit. And he's asking if you could explain that just a little bit further. Simply because you can be eminently rational um, and you can be eminently intelligent, but there is a quantity in life life that is difficult, life that does generate difficulties, problems, free will, choice to be or not to be. And I, I think I'm, for Augustine, the component that would be lacking is grace, the grace of God. Uh, but it's not lacking because even where sin doth abound, there does grace abound even more, even more. But we should trust the intellect, yes, but up to a point we, we, we can go off the tracks. And we should trust reason, but again, up to a point. It has limitations, but God's grace and goodness 
has no limitations. And God cannot be outdone in generosity, and that is why he is called the doctor of grace. That's not a, a mechanism. It's not a, a mechanical, you know, push the button and you get the response of grace. But there's, in, there's intelligence and there's reason and uh, there's, there's this hidden quantity of, of grace which is everywhere. And it's ours merely for the asking and maybe it takes, that's the mystery of God's grace operating. And Flannery O'Connor does very good on this subject of grace in her letters. Very, very concrete. Thank you for your participation in Augustinian Heritage Month. Father Lawless, thank you for, for being with us to continue this, this tradition. <laughs> <laughs>